Indian Lake, WXLQ, Bristol, Vermont, and WNYV, Whitehall, Glens Falls. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Friday, January 12th. I'm Todd Moe. Monica Sandreski is back next week. Governor Hochul releases her new state budget in just a few days amid a multi-billion dollar deficit. State Controller Tom DiNapoli says revenue collections are uneven, the economy is volatile, and he's nervous. We've been kind of flashing that yellow light of caution for a while, so I would still flash uh, that yellow light. The state says a solar company's application for a solar energy and battery storage site in Canton has been completed. Local officials will now have their chance to ask questions and raise concerns. We want our voices to be heard in the process. We want our local laws, particularly our solar law and our battery energy storage law and our zoning law to be incorporated into the conditions for the permit. 51 contestants have been competing in the Miss America pageant this week. One of them has North Country roots. Yamuna Turco is Miss Vermont. I'm just proud to represent everyone that I know and everyone that I will meet. And I know that at Miss America, I'm just going to do my best. and I'm going to bring that perspective with me and be able to broaden my perspective and share it with other people. The winner will be crowned Miss America on Sunday night. And John Warren checks outdoor conditions as we head into a potentially snowy winter weekend. All that's coming up in Northern Light. Stay tuned. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by the Depot Theater in Westport, inviting all to take a journey without leaving the station. Learn more at depotheater.org. And Seacom Credit Union, serving the financial needs of people throughout northern New York and northwestern Vermont in person, online at seacom.org and on your smartphone. This is Northern Light. I'm Todd Moe. More than 120,000 low-income children and pregnant women in New York State could be losing their food assistance dollars this year. The Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, provides nutritious food, breastfeeding support, and health care referrals to roughly 6.5 million participants nationwide. Due to food inflation, uh, food inflation and an increase in applicants, more money is needed to keep the program going. U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is leading a push to increase funding. With grocery prices still high and maternal and infant mortality on the rise, now is not the time to be further disrupting critical nutrition assistance programs for the most vulnerable Americans. Gillibrand wrote a letter to the House and Senate requesting an additional $1.4 billion in funding for WIC. Studies have shown that WIC is one of the most successful and cost-efficient nutrition intervention programs in the country. It not only improves outcomes for mothers and their babies, but it also reduces health care costs. If Congress fails to fund WIC adequately, new applicants and current participants could be placed on waiting lists. The application for a controversial 1,700-acre commercial solar project in Canton is complete. Catherine Wheeler reports local governments will now have the opportunity to lay out their concerns. EDF Renewables Development's proposed commercial solar project sites spread out along both sides of Route 11 just southwest of Canton. Rich Road would produce up to 240 megawatts of solar energy and include a 24-megawatt battery storage facility. EDF says in all it would generate enough energy to power more than 61,000 homes. The state's Office of Renewable Energy Siting, or ORES, regulates large-scale green energy projects in New York, and they have the power to override local zoning laws to get the projects up and running. That worries local Canton officials. Local communities as representatives of the public and residents, we speak through our laws. That's William Buchan. He is the attorney who represents the town of Canton on solar issues. We want our voices to be heard in the process. We want our local laws, particularly our solar law and our battery energy storage law and our zoning law to be incorporated into the conditions for the permit. Buchan says local governments and other parties will soon present their comments on the application to the administrative law judges who will oversee the hearings. He says the town of Canton has a long list of questions about Rich Road, things like aesthetics and the environment. 
Safety is also top of mind for local officials. A fire at a battery storage facility in Jefferson County last year raised a lot of questions about public health and if there's enough trained first responders to take on any accidents that could arise. We are concerned about the battery energy storage facility that's planned and the issues surrounding that. But in general, we are interested in the entire application. We will be looking at every element of it. The project is controversial. Some residents are apprehensive about how big solar panels will look as you drive into the village and how development will impact the land and water, while others think it's a much-needed step to address climate change. EDF says the communities and school districts will get millions in direct payments from the project. They say the two-year construction project will bring about 300 jobs, but only about three or four once the facility is up and running. According to Orez, the state will publish a draft siting permit for public comment or a notice of intent to deny the application by the end of March. Katherine Wheeler, North Country Public Radio. This week, Governor Hochul delivered her State of the State speech. Next week, she's due to release her 2024 budget plan. Hochul is expected to detail how she'll close a multi-billion dollar budget gap and how to pay for the care of tens of thousands of asylum seekers who came to New York over the past year. From Albany, Karen DeWitt reports. The state faces a $4.3 billion deficit for the fiscal year that begins April 1, and the gap is expected to grow to over $9 billion in the following year. On Tuesday, Governor Hochul will need to show in her budget presentation how she will close that gap. Choices range from tamping down on the rate of the growth of spending to raising taxes or imposing new fees. State Controller Tom DiNapoli, who provides independent oversight of the state's finances, finances, says revenue collections have been uneven. Tax collections are down from a year ago, and he says the economy is still volatile. We've been kind of flashing that yellow light of caution for a while, so I would still flash uh, that yellow light. He urges Hochul and the legislature to be careful managing the state's money this year. We have to make some tough choices on spending, be careful on taxation, and not resort to more debt. Hochul seems to agree with that advice. She told her state agencies last fall to hold the line on spending, and she said that she opposes calls from progressive lawmakers to increase taxes on the state's wealthiest residents. I'm not raising taxes in our budget this year. Taxes are high enough in the state of New York. And we have to live within our means. There's one area of spending that the governor may not be able to avoid increasing, and that is taking care of the over 100,000 asylum seekers who have crossed the southern U.S. border and have been bused to New York from states including Texas. Hochul avoided talking about the migrant crisis during her State of the State speech, saying she's putting off that controversial topic until she releases her spending plan. Last year, the state spent nearly $2 billion to help ease the migrant crisis. And when the mid-year budget report was released in October, the governor said the spending rate was unsustainable. Her budget director, Blake Washington, recommended that the state consider limiting spending on legal aid support and caseworkers who help the migrants find jobs. But the governor has also said there will be more money spent to help the migrants in the new budget. Senate Deputy Majority Leader Mike Gianaris who, like Hochul, is a Democrat, says the migrants are already in New York and need help, so the state will have to find a way to pay for it. The migrants are here, and uh, as long as they're here, we need to make sure uh, we provide for them as required by law and as required by humane values, which we have. So we'll do the best we can. Gianaris says New York will have to deal with the migrant crisis until the federal government does its job. The two biggest portions of the budget are health care and education. And in the past, when there have been multi-billion dollar deficits, governors have trimmed money from school aid and Medicaid. Hochul, in the past two years, has fully funded what's known as foundation aid for schools. She finally fulfilled a nearly two decades old court order that required the state to spend billions of dollars more on its poorest schools. So far, though, the governor has only committed to spending an additional $10 million to improve reading scores. 
Regarding health care spending, the state will be getting some help from the federal government. It granted a waiver to allow New York to spend nearly $6 billion more billion on health care over the next three years, targeted to financially struggling safety net hospitals, improving health equity, and funding more staff to ease ongoing shortages. Hochul's also said she'd like to use $200 million more million from the opioid settlement fund to help address the overdose crisis. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt for the New York Public News Network. The village of Saranac Lake has purchased the old Pius X High School building off of State Route 3. The village plans to build an emergency services hub on the 15-acre property with space for the village police department, the Saranac Lake Volunteer Rescue Squad, and the fire department. That's according to the Adirondack Daily Enterprise. Mayor Jimmy Williams said plans have not been finalized and that the village is still exploring funding options for the project. The village bought the property from Citizen Advocates. The nonprofit runs an outpatient mental health and addiction clinic there. Citizen Advocates retains about six acres right next to the former Pius X building and will continue to run its clinic. A community organizer and key figure in the Luge community in Lake Placid has died. Dmitry Feld was 68 years old. He was from Ukraine and moved to Lake Placid in the mid-80s to coach the USA Luge team. Feld was known for his charitable work, including with the local youth center and for humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. According to the Adirondack Daily Enterprise, Feld single-handedly raised more than $100,000 for the Ukrainian effort. In the early weeks of the war, he worked to hang Ukrainian flags in downtown Lake Placid. Feld spoke with reporter Emily Russell back in March of 2022. As soon as war started and I talked to my friends, I was trying to figure out how to support them. I thought since Lake Placid such an international village, had two Winter Olympic Games, and we have so many flags. I thought it would be very important to display our solidarity with Ukrainian people by displaying their flags. So I called mayor of the village of Lake Placid, and I told him about this idea. And uh, he said, that's a great idea, uh, but of course, since it's village or town, they have no money for this project. And I told him, don't worry about it. I'll pay. I'll pay from my own pocket if I have to, but of course... My generous friends and at USA Luge and everywhere else, we was able to raise money to pay for flags and have enough money to keep sending back to Ukraine. I wonder what that was like, first of all, to put the flags up and then to hear from folks in the community who wanted to donate to the effort and donate to Ukraine. Well, you know, when I asked electric department, they were like, no worry, we'll be right there. It was very emotional for for me. And when they was hanging first Ukrainian flag, it was great, but it, I was on the bottom and the flag was on high and that pole. So I asked the electric department if they can hoist me there and they said, sure. So here I was right on the top of that pole holding Ukrainian flag. And that was cool. It was really made me really connected to Ukrainian people that I was right there displaying that flag. Dimitri Feld speaking with North Country Public Radio back in March of 2022. Feld died earlier this week from cancer. He was 68 years old. Listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. It's 814. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. Monica has the day off. Stay with us. We'll hear the story of a young woman who grew up in Essex and Keysville who's representing the North Country at the Miss America pageant this week. It's all coming up right here on Northern Light.
music by The Curries out of Potsdam. Northern Light is supported by Adirondack Foundation, making grants to nonprofits that address community issues of child care, attainable housing, career pathways, basic needs, and more. Adirondackfoundation.org. This week in Orlando, 51 contestants have been competing in the Miss America pageant. And one of them has North Country roots. Yamuna, uh, Yamuna Turco grew up in Essex and Keysville. She attended elementary and high school in Plattsburgh before graduating from a Massachusetts boarding school. She's now a student at St. Michael's College in Vermont, which qualified her to compete for and win the title of Miss Vermont. Kara Chapman caught up with Turco about what it's been like to represent the Green Mountain State. A quick scroll through the Miss Vermont Instagram feed will tell you that Yamuna Turco has had a busy nine months. And we are at the Virgins Memorial Day Parade. I am in Montpelier for the 4th of July Day Parade. We are making upwards of 50 care packages. And we're at the Mary Heritage Day Festival. And we are back with my October episode of the Miss Vermont Voice. And I'm at the Enosburg Light Show, currently behind a bus. And I'm going to show you so many videos. Happy holidays, everyone. Turco says she's made more than 60 appearances as Miss Vermont since winning the title last April. That's on top of being a full-time student at St. Michael's College. I am a psychology and political science double major. Um, I'm hoping to go into community work. She's also an honors program member, a student leader with the college's community service program, and a peer note taker for fellow students. Turco says the emphasis at St. Mike's on volunteering and community is what led to her involvement with the Miss Vermont Scholarship Organization. You know, being Miss Vermont is not just about like being on stage and being like super confident and outgoing and like always like turned on and like always this public figure, but it's also about being able to connect with people. One of the requirements for the Miss Vermont and Miss America competitions is to create a community service initiative. Turco decided to focus on reading and called her initiative One Book, One Child. I seek to increase access to books and stories and help like foster a love of reading in kids. Turco says she's donated almost 400 books as Miss Vermont and talked to hundreds of elementary school kids about books and reading. She says she's found that often when kids don't like reading, it's because they don't have access to the books that they like. And once they have access to those books, they begin to fall in love with reading or maybe fall back in love with reading. Turco says her target age range for One Book, One Child is young elementary school students to early middle schoolers. She says that's when kids can struggle with reading, but also when they can find out what they enjoy about it. She says those are also the ages that reading opens so many worlds for her. I'm very fortunate that, you know, that my parents read to me, but because I am a first-generation American, they read to me to connect me with the world around me. Turco's parents immigrated to the North Country from South Africa. She grew up in Essex before they moved to Keysville, where they own a sheep and cattle ranch. So, Turco was well prepared for all the agricultural events she's attended around the Green Mountain State. I love cows with my whole heart. Um, and to, like, be from a state that has so many cows and so many, like, be able to attend so many agricultural-based events and festivals was incredible for me. But she's also had to step out of her comfort zone. Miss Vermont attends the Lake Champlain International Fishing Derby every year. Turco learned about the way stations and prizes people get for catching the biggest fish. And that was probably the most surprising thing to me because I don't know a ton about fishing. Like, I like fishing, but I'm not good at it. And learning about that was interesting. But it's also my favorite event, probably because I had to, I kissed a fish. Turco says she loves Vermont. It's a place she'd like to live. But she says when she wears the Miss Vermont sash, she's representing people from the North Country and South Africa, too. And so I'm just proud to represent everyone that I know and everyone that I will meet. And I know that at Miss America, I'm just going to do my best. and I'm going to bring that perspective with me and be able to broaden my perspective and share it with other people. The Miss America competition started in Orlando earlier this week. Turco's family and some friends are there with her. She's gone through the interview process as well as the preliminaries like evening gown and talent. Turco's talent is singing. Here she is at the 2023 Youth Talent Search in Enosburg Falls. Turco and the 
and the other state title holders will all go to the finals on Sunday to find out who made the top 10. If selected, she'll go through the question, fitness, evening gown, and talent portions again. The judges start from scratch and rescore all of that to determine the next Miss America. Turco says she's really grown during her time as Miss Vermont. And a big takeaway for her is that she's more capable than she thought she was. I didn't realize like how much I could do until I did this. And that's super important. You can find out if Turco made the top 10 by watching the Miss America finals at 7 p.m. this Sunday. They'll stream for free at watchmissamerica.com. Kara Chapman, North Country Public Radio. You can get more regional news, voices, conversations anytime on our website at ncpr.org. This is North Country Public Radio and Northern Light on this Friday, January 12th. I'm Todd Moe. The time now coming up on 822. Thanks for listening. And uh, coming up in just a moment, John Warren checks outdoor conditions for the region uh, as we head into this weekend, trail conditions and so forth. Uh, We've got some music featuring High on the Hog. They're going to be featured at a couple of community dances later this month. And we'll check what else is happening around the region. Some special events, theater and music coming up later this month. Weather Service says partly cloudy skies today and uh, some wintry weather moving into the region starting tonight and continuing through much of tomorrow. There is a winter storm warning in effect for primarily the Adirondacks winter weather advisories elsewhere. So snow moving into all of our regions starting late tonight and continuing throughout uh, much of tomorrow, at least through the uh, the first half of tomorrow with Maybe uh, up to half a foot of snow in some of the higher elevations by noon tomorrow. Uh, again, a winter weather, uh, winter storm warning in effect uh, starting 10 o'clock tonight through noon tomorrow. Snow and some mixed precipitation expected. Uh, maybe some ice accumulations of a light glaze and wind gusts as high as 50 miles per hour. The winter storm warning is for the Adirondacks, the winter weather advisory for the rest of our region. Again, tonight through tomorrow, strong winds and uh, snow and mixed pre- uh, precipitation expected uh, from late this evening through tomorrow afternoon. Right now in Canton, clouds and 21 degrees. And uh, John Warren checks out cork outdoor conditions uh, for the weekend. On Saturday, sunrise will be at about 729 and sunset at about 440. We now have at least 6 to 8 inches of snow most everywhere, with 8 to 12 inches at mid-elevations and 3 feet or more at the highest elevations. The northwestern Adirondacks remains a bit thin at the moment, however, although more snow is expected around the region. Keep an eye on the forecast. High peak summits are expecting winds to 60 miles per hour tonight and 40 to 60 miles per hour through the weekend. With heavy snow tonight that is expected to turn to moderate snow by Saturday morning and light snow through Sunday. Temperatures on summits will be in the teens and single digits this weekend with wind chill temperatures in the teens below zero Saturday and near 30 below on Sunday. Those are dangerous wind chill temperatures and should be avoided. That will make for some chilly downhill skiing this weekend. Although all downhill facilities will be open with plenty of terrain. Backcountry skiers will have to deal with blowdown and still thin conditions. Stick to the smoother, flatter terrain this weekend. The best bet will be in the southern Adirondacks, especially northern Warren and mid-Hamilton counties. The Racket and Long Lake areas should be skiable by Sunday. Cross-country ski areas will all be operating with Garnet Hill and Lapland Lake, the best bets this weekend for good conditions. Rivers and streams are well above normal for this time of year and remain mostly open. Ice remains mostly thin and dangerous. Snowmobile trails remain closed, although it's possible the Moose River Plains Road will be rideable by Sunday. 
Those are the outdoor conditions in the Adirondacks this weekend. For North Country Public Radio, this is John Warren from the New York Almanac, online at newyorkalmanac.com. This is Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 825. I'm Todd Moe. Monica is back next week. Thank you for listening this morning. And stay tuned. Coming up at 830, it's back to Morning Edition for more news. We've got business news in the next half hour. And then at 9 o'clock, join us for BBC News Hour live from London. There is music and dance uh, to kick off this first month of the new year. Uh, Traditional Arts in Upstate New York uh, kicks off their Cabin Fever concert series this winter with a community dance coming up Friday, January 19th. That's a week from tonight, 7 o'clock at Tawny in downtown Canton, a community dance. Dan Duggan calling the uh, the dances, the, the, the circle, square, reels, line dances, contra dances. And uh, Dan and uh, the trio High on the Hog will keep your feet moving with uh, great, lively, old-time string dance music featuring fiddle, uh, banjo, hammer dulcimer, Dan on the hammer dulcimer, and guitar. And uh, here is... High in the Hog with a tune called Sarah Armstrong's Patty on the Turnpike. the hog with the tune called patty on the turnpike and uh, come in from the cold and warm up at a community dance next friday night friday january 19th 7 p.m at tawny in canton you'll hear more live music by high on the hog dan duggan will be joining the trio and also calling some community dances next friday night January 19th, 7 o'clock, Tawny and Canton. And then you can join them at the Whalensburg Grange, a community dance with Dan Duggan. Music by High on the Hog, Friday, January 26th, 7 p.m. at the Whalensburg Grange. A great evening again of community dance with live music by High on the Hog. Also, I want to remind you, uh, there are a couple of performances by this young duo known as Archai. They've got two performances coming up. Saturday, January 27th, 7.30 at Lake Flower Landing in Saranac Lake. And then Sunday, January 28th, 3 o'clock, Saranac Fire Hall in Saranac, presented by um, Lake Flower Landing and also Hill and Hollow Music. If you want more information, check the website hillandhollowmusic.org. Archive, two young performers, some great music, and two opportunities to hear them live in concert. Saturday the 27th, Lake Flower Landing in Saranac Lake, and Sunday the 28th, Saranac Fire Hall in Saranac. That's it for Northern Light for this Friday, January 12th. Thank you so much for listening. Stay safe this weekend. I'm Todd Moe. Be well.